Hallelujah. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. On your way down, say good morning to somebody. All of our kids, J High High School, elementary, whatever it is in the classroom. If you're in a classroom in this place, we want you to be dismissed to your respective areas. We've got adults. Are you awake? Good, good. That's it. That's how you do it. All right, all of our kids, all of your kids, if you're in the room first time guest with us, we have people who have been preparing all week for your children. Whatever the age group, we've got something for them. And I think you should know this about our your kids program is that we pray over every area of the ministry. We don't just pray over this room. We pray over every area of the ministry. And it's, what's so good about that is that we're expecting God to do things in your kid's life, in our life, in our family's life that can't happen otherwise. Amen? Yeah. Uh, let's do this. Let's practice clapping. How about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Practice. All right. This is not the library. I don't want you to use your inside voice. This is an outside, inside, but outside voice in here. Because we, what we want to do is make sure that you see that when we look at our cultural components, when you came in the building today, you probably came and walked past those banners on the wall. And a lot of times we walk into places and we don't think of the art or the reason why something's on the wall or what, what's the purpose of it. Now, I know that there's many buildings and places that we don't really think much of what we're putting on the wall. But we specifically placed our core cultural components on the wall right here before you when you come in so that you get an idea of what you're getting into, the culture of the environment of Mending Place, uh, that you would know that we are intentional about trying to do the very best we can. It's our Bill of Rights, so to speak, of the church. So if you come in and you see something different than that, then you should please tug on my, my coat or something, say something to somebody. If you don't think that we are doing a best job of honoring the idea that we would rather build strong kids, then repair broken adults. That's what's on the wall out there when you walk by it. The very first one when you open the door says what? No, that's not the very first one when you walk in the door. It's one of them. But the number one when you walk in the front door says what? People are not an interruption. You walk by it so much you probably just forget it, right? But when you open the door and you see that one right there first and foremost, I want you to think about the idea that we are setting a standard and a tone for everybody who walks through these doors. That the very first thing they see, beyond anything else, maybe the parking lot guys or whatever, they're going to see this phrase, this statement, that whatever the issue, whatever the challenge, whatever it is that you might be coming in with, it's not an interruption to what we're doing. Because that's ministry. That's ministry. And I know some of you came in with some stuff. How many of you are bold enough to admit you came in with something this morning? All right, all right, all right. I got here first. I came in with something. I tried to... <laughs> I try to get rid of it, but, but, but what we are talking about is the idea that this is a place where you can get mended. This is a place where you can be impacted and do some impacting, that you can be part of the, the solution and some, someone else comes in with problems, but we know that God has a fix for all of it. And so we're confident in that. We are, of all things, a confident church, regardless of size, because we're not confident in ourselves. We're confident in the fact that Christ has made us and called us to be here in this place. Now, you may come in thinking that you're going to be ministered to, but at some point in time, as you mature along the way, you realize that there is ministry for you to do. Amen. Amen. If, you still, if, you've been go if you've been saved 10 years and you keep coming into the church and you're still thinking about being ministered to, then you need to get off the milk and get on meat. At some point in time, you've got to realize that disciples make disciples. Not pastors make disciples. <laughs> if you didn't know what you were listening to, you didn't clap. Okay, so <laughs> let, let's think about this, this idea of eating from my plate. So I've been in the series, and I've done this before on a Wednesday night, but I'm, today I'm going a little further in the series that we started on a Sunday that I'm actually doing it, sharing it. That uh, to eat from my plate is what I eat, what, I, what the Lord's showing me, sharing with me in the Word that's different than sometimes I might have outlined for us as a church. So sometimes in prep, I may give like three or four or five, six months of, serve, of ideas, sermon topics we need to do so that you would be better and help us develop as a church and help you develop as disciples of Jesus Christ. It's easy for me to do that, set them all up. We're going to do this in this season. We're going to do this in this season. We're going to talk about this in this season. We're going to talk about it in this season. And then we just fill in the, the spaces with the specifics of that particular topic. But I decided that I wanted to share a little bit about what I study on my own with us as a group 
because I think that it would be important during this hour, during this season, right after the season of uh, Easter and in this Pentecost season to think about what I might be seeing and hearing from the Holy Spirit that you might need to know as well. So last week we kind of got it started, got kicked off, had, had a good time talking about breaking boxes. Anybody remember last week's message? Okay, so what was I talking about then? Ah, oh, okay, all right, all right, all right, yeah, yeah. I know, you forget, you forget, sometimes I forget. But what I want you to do is I want you to pay close attention to today's message because we go a little bit further. This is what the Holy Spirit's been talking to me about. He's been talking to me about, and I believe that he's talking to us about it. And so I, I thought that I would share it with you just some of my private study stuff, what's been going on in my heart, and, and I, I think it's going to blow your mind. So I'm watching the news, and I start seeing things about shootings taking place uh, in FedEx, FedEx factory. You guys see that? Mass shootings. Uh, we, see, we see shootings happen in Minneapolis, protests going on there. Uh, you've known and have heard me talk about social justice issues going on within our country, our nation. And I, I, I think it's a privilege to stand before you and talk about those things from time to time. But as I was thinking about what was going on in the news cycle and all the, the banter and all the challenges that we face as a, as a people, uh, I, can, I can't speak to what's going on in the world because I don't know everything that's going on in the world, but as, it, as I, it relates to me being a part of this system, being a part of the United States of America and what's going on here and what that might mean for you and I, what's going on with you locally, what's going on with you personally, that this is a great time for us to talk about that the world is, has never been smaller than it is right now. Isn't it, don't you feel like the world is more connected now than it ever has been? I was thinking about um, growing up. I grew up with uh, my grandmother raised me, and uh, she oftentimes asked, if I would ask a question, she would always tell me, quit asking so many questions. <laughs> Anybody's parents ever told you that? <laughs> it was basically her way of saying, I don't know. Uh, but, but it was so interesting that as I got older and I realized that I'm in now in this, in this phase where we have all this technology and we are connected to ac access to information, access to people and relationships. I remember having conversations after George Floyd's death with people who were in Israel who were protesting as well. And I thought to myself, people in Israel are protesting something that happened on the streets here in the United States. It just was blowing my mind that I was seeing this happen from a global perspective. And then to think about the pandemic on top of that, that we were all being impacted by an uh, unseen virus that's going on, going around the world. I thought that this was a great sign of us showing that the world is smaller than it has ever been before. And I can only imagine that it's going to increasingly get smaller. But the thing that really threw me off wasn't that the world was getting smaller and we could connect and touch people with just the, the thing that's in the palm of our hand, but it's the fact that I saw and felt that we were increasingly getting further apart from each other. That how is it that the world could be getting smaller and we could be, have access and be easily connected to information and ideas and people and people groups and difference, but at the same time we could find ourselves being distanced from each other. At the same time, we see the impact of COVID on the church and the gathering and the assembling of ourselves together. That it's been so long that some habits have formed in some people who were consistent at one point in time that are now inconsistent. And we, we are challenged with the idea that the church, yes, has been benefited in some ways because we've seen some strength in the church that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. But at the same time, there's, there's this idea that we can't gain all without losing something. And I thought in my time of study and reflection that we have been losing the benefit of relationship and fellowship. That we're more connected. Some of you now clicking in online, some of you who will be able to catch up with us midweek in your busy schedule, you could click in and just jump in and watch and see and participate. And all of that at the same time we find people who are disconnected. How can it be? The scripture says that we shouldn't forsake the assembling ourselves together as the custom of some, and I'm afraid that we have become custom, accustomed to being separated, to being distanced. And so this message at its core, I'm going to give you the insider information, the secret here is that you would see the value of fellowship. You would see the value of belonging. You would see the value of connecting. And I'm going to take us on maybe on a little of a journey to try to show that or express that to us. But I think that you can get something out of this because what I see is that we have a mental health issue because of our loneliness. You're in the room, but you're lonely. You're in the relationship, but you're lonely. You don't feel connected or identify with anything that might be going on in your life that looks consistent and what is a part of your normal cycle. I'm here, 
but I'm really not here. That's a problem for the church. That's a problem not only for the church, it's a problem for us, as us disciples within the church to talk to people who are struggling in their own skin, struggling in their own mind between their two ears. And it would be wrong for us to think that there is, it's, the answer is just at the bottom of a pill. We're not diminishing the fact that you might be on medication. That's okay, because we're going to be talking about that. It's, it's okay if that's where you're at. But I think that we would be wrong if we think that it's only going to be there, that it has to be prescribed from somebody with a few initials behind their name to get you fixed. We need both and. Now, some people are doing their own kind of mental health. Got a little something to drink, a little something to sip, a little something to smoke, a little something to take. You do your own thing. You could do a little something behavior to make you feel a little bit more alive, connected in some way. This message is for you because we live in dangerous times. And the more dangerous the time, the more important it is for you to find yourself connected to a group. Because we all have seen the TV shows, the great outdoors and We've seen what happens to people who get separated from the group. If you see the herd of antelope and the gazelle, as they see the lion coming, if you take the wrong turn, it'd be easy for you to be picked apart by those that pursue. And we know the enemy is out pursuing people all the time. And this is one of the benefits you need to realize that there is protection in the group. If I was writing anything down, that would be one thing that I would write down. That you need to just remember that there's protection in the group. And I know that you get irritated in the group too. I know. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that you don't have problems with people that you don't like in the group, and you know, I, I know. You, there's things in your family you don't like, so on and so but there's protection in the group. And the enemy's job is to get you frustrated, get you fractured, to get you, get you to a place to where you think you can go it alone, whether it's in your natural family or now in your spiritual family, that you can do without the group. I hear this all the time. You, maybe you've heard this from people who think they're real spiritual. They'll say stuff like this, I have my own personal relationship with the Lord. Anybody ever heard somebody say that? Now, who's bold enough to say that you said that before when you were trying to cop out? Yeah, okay, yeah. When you're trying to get away from the idea that the group is valuable and you don't want to put up with what the group may call you to, you start saying things like that because it makes you seem really cool and really in the know. It's personal with me and him. But I will tell you, every weirdo starts off by themselves. Anybody ever seen a spiritual weirdo? They don't go to church anywhere. They don't have pastors. They're out there by themselves. And you, you start talking about, like, where do you go to church at? Because I'm trying to stay away from where you go to church at. And they say, you know what? I, I don't go anywhere. I just read my own word. Well, that's a problem. You have, to be, you have to be under authority. God has given us shepherds and pastors for a reason. Now, you may think I'm just talking about this, but I want you to do some work today. I don't want you to be in the, the, the work of avoidance state. So go in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. And I, I kind of set us up, but I want you to see something that God knew about you, about creation. He knew something about you. He knows something about me. He knows something about us that we need to be reminded of as we think about this idea that mental health matters. I've seen churches, listen to me, I've seen churches just try to pray it out of people. I've seen people that's relegated to a spiritual issue and there's demons or there's a spiritual thing going on with people. And there's no space for people to say, just like I might have a broken arm or a broken foot, I have something wrong with me chemically or imbalance in some place. That's true. But then there's something relationally that we have to acknowledge as well. In the scriptures, Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 18, I'm reading the King James Version. It says this, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be... Help me out here. Okay, all right. Are you reading with me? I will make him a helpmeet for him. All the things that God said were good, he comes to this point, he starts talking about the things that not necessarily are bad, but the things that we need to be cautious of. 
that out of the things that I have made, the way that I made man, I, I'm letting you know something that it's not good for him to be alone. Now, I thought it strange that in the conversation that God is having here uh, with us and with Adam and with creation and with all those who will read his word afterwards, he's talking about the, the, the idea that first there's a garden, there's this place that he's put in order. This is a place of perfection, a place that is on the east side of Eden. And, and then he starts talking about man's mental health condition. I thought like, why in the world would God talk about this place of perfection and then at the same time start talking about the idea that there is something that we have to be concerned about that even when we are in perfect places, we still have to be worried about our psychological health. Because we think that sometimes if I'm just in a perfect place, then I'll be healthy psychologically. And that's not true. If I could just get into this perfect relationship, if I could just find the perfect church, if I could just find the perfect you fill in the blank, then I would be healthier psychologically and emotionally, and that is not true, my friend. We see it as God explains it here to, about Adam's condition. He says, you can be in a good place. Stop trying to find a perfect place to be so that you can be healthy emotionally. He says the issue with health emotionally is not about your location. It's about the fact that you're by yourself. And he uses the garden as a way to show us that we must cultivate our internal state just like the external. You see the two words that he uses here? He says there must be a dressing and a keeping of the garden. There must be a dressing and a keeping of your mind. There is no way that you're going to be able to be healthy just like the garden when it's going to be healthy without Adam doing a little bit of work. <laughs> Ah, it'll work if you work it. But if you don't work it and you think that you're going to be able to just hang out, go through life without ever dressing or keeping your mental state, you're going to put yourself in a position where you're going to have a bunch of nasty roots, a nasty existence, and fruit dying on the vine. I love the idea of this word dress because it means to actually work or to till. I heard somebody recently tell me that we were never intended to actually work with our hands, but we were supposed to speak everything. And that's so far from the truth scripturally, because we see this right here in Genesis. Who, who says that? Somebody who's trying to be spiritual. Who, somebody who says they want to be mystical. But that's not even scriptural. That's not even a thought. That's not even the, what kind of theology is that? So you just, sit, you just sit in a room somewhere and think your way into to health and paychecks and <laughs> that's clownish. But what we see here in the text, we say that God always intended for man to do what? He said work. He wants you to be able to work at it. He says that your mind by itself, if you leave it to itself, you will be in a place that is dangerous to you. You must work. You must serve. You have to till your mind. You have to till it, which means you have to do what? Turn it over. You got to break up fallow ground. You got to get in and pull things out of it. Because we know that the word is like seed sown and there's types of soils. There's some that fall on the wayside, some that fall on the rocky, some that fall on the thorny, and some that fall on good ground. And your mind is, has four stages in it just like that. And there's things in your mind that you're going to have to uproot. There's things in your mind that you have to continue to turn over. And there's things in your mind that you have to accept. Even when I don't understand it all, I have to believe that that word, the word of God, which is an incorruptible seed, is intended for me. Now, I have to wrestle with all the cares of this world. I have to wrestle with the shallow places in my life. But nonetheless, we see God saying that you have to till your ground in your own mind. There's ground tilling that needs to be done. I love the smell of freshly turned dirt. How about you? Anybody like that? Now, I don't necessarily like to be dirty. But I like to smell the ground that's been freshly tilled. <laughs> so we see this idea that God is showing us because he tells Adam what he's going to have to do in the natural. But then he also, through implication and through reference and inference, he says, this is the same way that you have to do in your mind. One of the things we're seeing in our society is that we see people who are left to themselves. They're left by themselves. And when you're left by yourself, you get into a dangerous place. Look at scripture. Everybody who's left by themselves ends up getting into destructive behavior and patterns. At the time that kings would go out to war, David is not at war. He's sitting on his balcony, perusing other rooftops. And the next thing you know, he's in bed with another woman because he was by himself in a season when he should have been with his army. And it's no different from you. You will be like Elijah, 
who has the greatest victory on Mount Carmel and then by himself says, this is too much for me, Lord, I want to die because he's by himself. Great men and women of God, just like you and I, are in danger when we are by ourselves. Solomon tells a story to his son. He says, I see a young man, Proverbs chapter 7, void in his understanding, walking the streets by himself, and there is a woman who catches him, and with her sweet words and her luscious lips, draws him in and tempts him and brings him into her own bed. That's why, because he was by himself. You have to be careful when you're by yourself. Now, we see people who are acting out because a lot of times people who are by themselves act out because we don't ever address or say something about it. At least will you put my slide up? Because accountability is important, but we would prefer autonomy. We don't like acknowledgement as much as we think because we like anonymity. Some people like to go to churches where people won't really know that they're there. But let me tell you something. Many places, we'll know that you're not here. We sniff you out. <laughs> where are you at? Where are you at? Puts pressure on you. You might think that you like acknowledgement, but we don't like it when it becomes a, a position of pain or frustration for us because, man, they all expect me to be there. They really calling me. They keep inviting me. They keep sending me text messages on my phone. <laughs> That's her fault. She's doing all that. Okay. You, you, you think about it and you say, I don't like this much interaction because it reminds me of what I'm not doing, even though I know that I should be. I don't want to be acknowledged. Let me just come in, sneak in and out when I feel like it. I like that. And then lastly, we don't like authority, even though we say we really, who, who in the room would say they don't like authority? Okay, one or two. Okay, brave men. Brave men and women who say, I don't like people telling me what to do. And, and, and the church is built on this structure. It's built on the idea that someone's going to lead you, that someone's going to lead you somewhere that you couldn't get yourself. Green pastures, still waters, that, he, that there's someone leading you somewhere that everyone needs a pastor. Just like everybody needs a doctor, so everybody's going to need a pastor. So you need a pastor. How many of you got a pastor in here? Only a few of you think, okay, I'm, I'm watching, I'm watching. Okay, all right, all right, all right. That was a trick question. I like throwing them out there to see if you're awake. Because, because, because what I end up seeing is that we always like this idea of getting married in the church, buried in the church. Am I in the right place? We, 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 we like having church folks come to our aid and hospitals and otherwise. But other than that, we don't want the church to be bothered with our life at all. I don't want any of that authority in my life. I just want you to give me the goods that the church has to offer. Why is that? Because we prefer being anonymous. We prefer being autonomous. We prefer anarchy in our lives, whether we say it or not, we do. Now, I could argue with you because some of you are very argumentative, and I like to argue too, but I won't do it right now. If you don't believe the slide, let's just talk a little bit later on. Guess what that's going to prove? That you don't really like authority. <laughs> Pastor, I'd like to have a meeting with you. Yes, which one of these is it that you don't like? Tricked you. All right, so let's go a little bit further, and I want you to think about this isolationist behavior. I remember in law enforcement when we, went, when we did a deep dive into Columbine, one of the very first like, mass shootings that we were like, wow, what's going on here in the United States? And so we got a chance to go in, and Dylan Klebold and the other young man, they were all all very isolated. They were preparing bombs and they were doing all these things in their own garage at their house, in their bedroom. Parents, I didn't know that was going on. How many of you would be guilty of the exact same thing because you really don't know what's going on? Whether it's in your children or more importantly, whether it's in the childish places in your life that you kind of separate and put to the side and you really don't want to be seen or even ask the question of what's going on in that room or behind that door or with that issue or with that circumstance. I'd rather not know so I won't say anything because the confrontation might be too costly. But the fact that there was no confrontation 
if they really did not know, cost a lot of, a lot of other people their lives. I believe that whether it's with every active shooter or with everyone who abuses their power and authority, who wears uniform, or with everyone that's in this church and everyone else that lives listening to the sound of my voice, that if you are in a place to where you could be seen like this or, or ignored like some, you present yourself as a very active and real danger to those you do life with, the childish parts of you that you're will, unwilling to address and to open the door and see what's going on. When we look at this text, we see that the Lord then tells them not only to dress it, but to keep it. And that simply means that you have to hedge it about. You've got to put some guardrails up, and you've got to protect your mind. You've got to protect your mind. Not only do you have to dress it, but you have to then keep it. You've got to make sure that other things just can't run in and out of it whenever they want to. I talk about this sometimes, about the fact that we do a very poor job of really governing our mind. Even now as you're in the room, how many of you have been here and other places? I won't even fill in the blank where the other place might be because our mind is desperately wicked and who could know it? You've been here and other places while we've been in the room because our mind needs what? Guardrails. You have to train your mind because if your mind is one that you haven't really told it no, it always wants a yes. If you've, never, if you've never told yourself to quit thinking about that, move on to something else, if you've never told your mind that that's enough of that, you've got you to stay here right now and get things done, I'm afraid of the outcomes in your life. If you've never been the type of person to govern their thinking, what I will think on and what I won't, you have to guard your heart with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. With all diligence, which means with everything I have in me, I have to guard what's going on between these two ears. I've got to make sure that I realize that the battle is just not in front of me by the things I see, but it's internally in me. And I win that battle before I could ever win anything that's outside. I have to make a decision on what I'm going to think about myself and a situation or circumstance before I can be effective in any of it. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15 says this, and I want you to look closely at this. Because I think we are dealing with some of this. New King James, the rod, you'll see some rhythms here. I want you to pick up the rhythms. Uh, the rod and the rebuke. The rod and what? Rebuke. Give wisdom. But a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. When the wicked are multiplied, transgressions increase, but the righteous will see their fall. Correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. These are prophetic utterances here, and we see that the word revelation is a prophetic vision. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people will cast off restraint. When people can't talk to you about what should be, what will be, what can be, you will lose hope and you will not address some things that you should address. The very first passage that we read in this, this, this chapter says that the rod and rebuke give wisdom. It sounds a lot like dress and keep. So we're thinking about the idea of how we actually do this dress and keep. I've given you an idea about why it's important to, but then more importantly than how you do it on a day-to-day -day basis in and out of your existence, where you go and who you talk to, how do I actually govern this mind of mine? How do I make sure that I am thinking about my mental health? and that I'm not just blaming it, or am I, I'm not just duh, putting it off on someone else, or I'm not just self-medicating myself. And the church sometimes, I hate to say it, but the church can be in its, its own way a type of narcotic for you. That you come in, you get a little bit of hit, and you walk out and you leave, but you never really have any real lasting change because you thought that it was just about being here in the seats for 90 minutes. I hate that the church could be that for you. And sometimes there is emotion, which is fine, but it can't just be emotion. At some point in time, it has to move to principle that you can actually then apply some principle to get some, some movement in the areas of your life because I know that Monday you want to be successful too. You want Tuesday to be as well, just as well. You want Thursday and Friday. You want, all, you want days of the week to actually count and matter and you to be able to control them and them not control you. But if we only talk about the emotional state, 
about say this, do this, be this in the room, and you don't do any of it outside the room, then we deceive ourselves, being hearers only and not doers. This text elevates something for me, that the rod and the rebuke give wisdom. This is a good word. Underline that in your scripture or your text, if you can highlight it, that it actually gives. The rod and rebuke give wisdom. I thought, man, that wisdom came some other way. But this, this proverb is talking about some very painful-sounding stuff that then brings about wisdom. I don't like that idea. This feels complicated. Uh, this doesn't feel like the type of message that I would want to come here. Why would you have me drive here to hear this stuff that you're saying that, that, that everyone needs wisdom? Yeah, and all that getting get understanding. That you need wisdom, and wisdom is the principal thing. It's the chief thing. I told my kids all the time, and my daughter's back there on the camera, and she would tell you that I always tell my sons this especially. It's better to be wise than to be right. We have taught a generation of children how to be right that lack wisdom, and because they then lack wisdom, they lack empathy, and they lack, they lack the ability to know how to apply the knowledge that they have. And so it's all about being right, and it's never really about being wise, but we see the scripture here says that you have to make sure that your children just aren't right, but that they are wise. I'd rather have kids who score C's and D's, but be wise. I don't want them to score C's and D's. I'm not saying I want that. I'm just saying. It would be better if they had A's and were wise. But if I couldn't get one or the other, I had to pick. I would pick wisdom every day of the week over. I was raised by a woman with a fourth grade education. I would prefer her wisdom over anything academically that she thought that she knew where she could teach me. I operate in it daily. What my streets and the neighborhood taught me. There was a wisdom there about life that I was taught in the moment, in the room, by this classroom called life, that if I would ignore it, then it would bring me pain. This is why the text here says that it has to be that the rod and rebuke keep us. It gives wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother shame. I thought about this idea of shame. Like how many people are dealing with the shame of being unguarded in their mind? The fact that you don't like authority then puts us in a place to where no one can really tell you that you're wrong. No one could tell you the rod, which is a stick, uh, uh, something used for punishment, correction. Every shepherd has a staff. <laughs> what, then what else is there? That the rod is there and then also rebuke. How many of you do well when people tell you that you're wrong? Not many, that's why you don't raise your hand to answer questions because we don't like to be wrong in the room. By default, what, what's, the, what's, what's two plus two? I'll ask that and some people will just sit there and look at me like I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> what is two, don't want to raise your hand and say anything. Why? Because you don't want to run the risk of being wrong. Because you don't like the idea of being rebuked or exposed in the room for being wrong. Can I tell you that the childish areas of your life they're depending upon the fact that there's no wisdom getting in because you're unwilling to be corrected about the things that you do wrong. And that makes some churches a bad place for others to be because I don't like to be corrected. I like to be patty caked. I like to be massaged. I like to be talked into a place of de delight and bliss. Wow, what a phenomenal message, Pastor. But at some point in time, I'm not really doing my job if you don't come out of here and say, I don't know if I'm coming back there next week. <laughs> I'm looking at a brother who said that it was tough sometimes. <laughs> to me, it's the greatest compliment you could give me. <laughs> because it says to me that at some point in time, the Holy Spirit is doing what the Holy Spirit can do in your life. And you sometimes, I, I've told you this before, I had people tell me that they thought that I was watching them or spying on them throughout the week. Why are you talking about this stuff? Are you watching me? It seems like you're only talking about me. And I just tell people, quite honestly, stop being prideful. You're not that amazing that people are going to be watching you and looking at you. It's just the Holy Spirit working through me on you. It's just proving that God is real and alive and he's saying that you've got to get some things corrected in your life. Because if we don't have rebuke, if we don't have a rod, wisdom doesn't come any other way. It says that it gives, that, that rod and rebuke gives wisdom. 
Now, I know that we like to do a lot of talking, and we would consider ourselves great psychologists, and we could be able to talk somebody into obedience. But the greatest level of obedience that I've ever experienced came through pain. It's what brought me out of some stuff. When I had to say, ouch. When that thing bit me. That thing cost me more than I thought that I could ever afford to pay for that experience or that way of thinking or that behavior or whatever it might be that in life there was the rod and the rebuke. Life offered it to me whether I wanted it or not. Especially when I refused it from those who cared most about me, life was unrelenting in how it gave this teaching moments and points in my own life. The beauty of wisdom is the fact that you can get it and you can learn from someone else's pain and someone else's rod experiences. And if, you will, if you're a good student, you can learn from theirs and you don't have to experience it yourself. That's the beauty of it, right? But if you're unwilling to, to, to receive that at any way, point, or time, then whatever the area is in your life, I'm telling you, how do you decide? How do, Pastor, how do I determine what's childish in my life? Well, just, just think about the areas in your life where you don't like people to tell you what to do in. That's childish, right? You, you, you identify it right then. I don't like to be corrected, nor do I even like to think about the punishment that might come from this area of my life. I like to keep it secret and hidden, like to keep it put away. This is compartmental. It's over there. No one needs to worry about it. This is my thing. I told you that we live in a society right now where we are by ourselves more than we ever, ever have been in all of existence because we can operate without the group. I believe the development of the middle class is one of those issues. That it causes you to be in such a place to where you can operate outside the group. You don't need the neighborhood. You don't need the family. You don't, I could pay for those things, so I don't need people. I don't need to make sure those relationships are healthy because I can do it on my own financially. I can be this way. It's autonomy that creates such a dangerous place for us to be. And then that bleeds over into the church. And we says, I don't necessarily need that because I can go to any church. I can go to five churches. I can stay home. I can click a button. I can be here. It keeps us in a place to where we have nobody that can look us in the eye and say, something's going on with you. What is it? I, I, I was probably the last generation that was um, where schools could actually spank kids. Did anybody got, anybody was, grew, grew up where you could get spanked in school? <laughs> Somebody said they had a couple of them. Uh, but they didn't call spanking, they called them swats. I think that was the technical term, the swatting. Uh, it, it, it was funny to me that I remember going to school and that was a, a viable punishment. Like that was like a real life punishment. Uh, I can't tell you that I didn't think about that often when I was acting up or misbehaving. Like in the back of my mind back there was like, you might go to the principal's office and they might actually spank you right here, right now. Like, you don't even have to wait till you get home. You can get it right now in this room, in this building. You know, it was, it was there, and that, that little bit of something kept enough tension on me to be like, okay, all right. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm good. I'm okay. I'm done. I won't do any more. I had a friend one day who blew past all the guardrails. He was just, he was just one of those radicals. He just, I mean, I don't know what got into him that day. Something happened. Something happened to him. He just got wild. The teacher was like, you know, if you do that one more time, I'm going to send you to the principal's office. This is fourth grade. And he just kept going. He kept going. He just wouldn't stop. She said, okay, that's it. I'm sending you to Mr. I forgot the principal's name. So he goes to the principal's office. The next time I see him, his face is red. He's crying. And his behavior has been changed. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. I don't know what happened. What happened to you, man? I want to hear the story. Insider information. Now, uh, before I get started, before I go any further, I'm not saying or prescribing that you, someone needs to whoop your kids. I'm not saying that. <laughs> Some of y'all need to whoop your kids, but no one else needs to whoop your kids, right? Well, so what, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, is that when we, see, when we see this all played out, he comes back to me and he has a story to tell that then reinforced the idea that obedience is better than sacrifice. Yeah. I, see, I saw that all played out. I said, I think what I'm going to do is not do what you did. And he, he described the paddle to me. He started describing the paddle, the, the principle, the moment, bend over the desk. He had the paddle out. He had holes in the paddle. I said, what type of medieval device is this that you're talking about? This wooden paddle. 
And then he was like, you know, I, it, it was funny because he only got like three or four swats. But it was enough to adjust the behavior. Now you say, this throws you off because you're not into corporal punishment. I got you. But what about the childish areas of your life that you're unwilling to get corrected? <coughs> cause you to act up. Cause you to show out in. Cause you to be a disruption to the classroom. Your disruption to the family, your disruption to your organization, your disruption in so many ways to your team, your disruption because you haven't had anybody use the rod or rebuke because every time it happens, you're big enough to where you don't have to be there and you can walk out. The challenge of your chronological age and then dealing with people who are spiritually immature are always in conflict with each other because you're big enough, bold enough, you make enough money to where you don't have to listen to anybody. You can go and leave and not show up and not be there, and you're going to punish me by not ever coming again. I'm going to punish this church by not participating. Well, if you think that that's going to be the, the mature way of responding, because there's the conflict now between your, spirit, your, your maturity in age and your immaturity spiritually, and they're always on display, and you now are going to leave because you can physically, and it eliminates your ability to grow and develop spiritually. It does it all the time. Now, this is the same thing that plays out in our communities, where everybody is right all the time. That whatever you feel is right, whatever it is you want to do is right, and no one's got the guts or the gumption or if I was in another place, I'd say something else, to actually stand up to people and tell them, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard you say. You need to get yourself together. Why in the world would you think that? Just because you feel something don't mean it's true. When was the last time someone had a real honest conversation with you about something in your area that's childlike or infantile? To tell you the truth so they push you into growth. It might hurt. It may be frustrating. You might not want to hear it. But a child left to himself will not only bring his mother shame, but it will bring a community shame, it brings a nation shame. That when we leave a generation to itself, what happens, it's unimaginable. Now, you might think that it's just here at this macro level, but I always wanted to bring it back down to you. Who's at risk if you are unwilling to mature in those areas that you know the Holy Spirit's been talking to you about? Who's at risk? Who might be an innocent bystander to your immature ways? Who might go to work and not come home, proverbially? Who might be the people who receive stray bullets because you are immature in some area of your life and nobody but nobody could talk to you about the benefits of rod and rebuke i know that the church is supposed to be that but we have defaulted to numbers we've defaulted to making it seeker friendly come in everyone is welcome and everyone is but Jesus welcomed everybody by saying that every son will be what? Chastened. Oh my goodness. Is that your invitation? That everybody that comes is gonna get a whooping? I mean, that's not, I mean, that's that's gonna keep the numbers low, Jesus. It's gonna keep them low. But I hope that you see this played out not only in the streets and on the news cycle, but in your life that you would be able to take this message and realize that God wants you, yes, he wants the garden to be defended and protected and kept, but then also he wants you to realize that to do this in our mind, it's gonna require somebody else to help us do that. The Lord wasn't walking around hanging out with, with Adam the whole day. Scripture says that, uh, that he came at the cool of the day, you know? There's freedom and choice in the, in, the, in the garden for him to do and to not to do. So he gave him that. And the same thing that you have, you've got choice now, even in your mind, you're thinking what you will do and what you won't do. What you'll pay attention to and what you'll ignore. 
what you'll think that I'm talking about somebody else and not talking about you. Whatever it is that's there in your mind, I would encourage you to think about this. And then, more importantly, I'd be, I'd be most happy if you actually acted on it and not just thought. But you put guardrails up. And you would, you would, the next time someone says something to you that seems in conflict with what you want to do, what you think is right, that you would give it enough pause to think, maybe this is a part of that whole rod and rebuke thing that Pastor was talking about. That it causes me to pause. Now, I'm asking some of you to be courageous to actually say this to people who are saying things that don't make sense. That if there's somebody who you can see the immaturity in them coming out, remember a, a child left to themselves will bring their mother shame. That's, any, that's anyone who's childish in the area of their life. I'm encouraging you when you hear childish talk, that you would then engage and say, well, what makes you think that? Where'd you get that idea? That doesn't make sense. You haven't thought about that long enough. Whatever it is that needs to be said that you would be challenging in it because we need that in this hour and this day and age. We need it. That truth wouldn't just be here in these four walls. That we would take it with us whenever we're interacting with people and we, we would say things. I pray that you'd be skilled in it, but that you would then, in the, in the very least, that you would ask a question to maybe have someone take another look or another perspective on what they might have said. God is a master at asking questions. He asks us questions to help us find ourselves and identify ourselves. I'm going to ask you a question. And the question is, have you thought about this idea of submission to authority? Is your life a picture of all the things that you just do whatever you want to do and no one can tell you anything otherwise? I believe that those of you who are in the room who have never surrendered yourself to the idea that Jesus has come to be the author and the finisher of your faith, the writer of your purpose, your story, that you live the most chaotic and anarchy life of all. I don't care if you can pay your bills. I don't care if you got some things on the go. I'm talking about the idea that you have your own agenda and you refuse God's agenda. This message is for you. I don't want you to live in that place of chaos any longer. I don't want you to be the type of people who are conflicted and saying, you know what, I got my plans. The text, the scriptures say that his plans are better for us than our own. We have to believe that. For everyone who's bucking authority and saying, I don't want to, I want to, I want a savior, but I don't want a Lord. The God I'm talking about is both. He's both savior and Lord. I want to pray with you. If you're in the room, you say, pastor, that's me. I, I'm struggling with this idea of authority. I don't know. I want to be saved. I know that all my plans, all the things that I've thought of, all the things that I've imagined to be my life, they're just chaotic and they, they, I've refused. I've refused because I don't like the idea of being corrected. I don't like the idea of being challenged in my thoughts. I've refused because it's just too much. I want to pray for you. That's you. That's you. You say, Pastor, that's me. I've never surrendered to the idea that I need a Savior, that Jesus came to save. He came to save those who are like me who are chaotic, who, who have a mind that's un, unfiltered, unhinged. I go where I want to, do what I want to, think what I want to, say what I want to. In this moment, you've come face to face with the idea that I'm just like this example. I'm like a child that's been left to himself. I'm ashamed of a lot of things. Holy Spirit, help me find those who are in the room, that's me, Lord. That's me. If that's you, can I see your hand? I want to pray with you. I want to share with you the same acknowledgement that I had to make at some point in time and many others in the room have done. I want to share with you that this next step, the next step is not only a step of surrender, but it's a step of victory. There's some things that you can't get until you're willing to stay still. If that's you, you said, Pastor, that's me. I've never accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, and I want to today. Can I see your hand? I want to pray with you. Yes. 
So maybe you're in the room and you say, Pastor, I've, I'm saved, but can I be honest with you? My mind is like the mind that you've been talking about. It's completely unchecked. Unchecked, unhindered. If someone were to be able to look at it like a garden, it's got weeds, it's got thorns, it's got thistles, it's got all kind of stuff in it because it's a filthy place. I've been doing my very best to present things well on the outside, but my mind on the inside is chaotic and overgrown and overrun. My walls are broken down. I've got no barriers. I don't like being told no. I don't do good at telling myself no. Pray for me. Pray for me in my current mental state, my current mental health. I'm around more people than I've ever thought possible, but I'm still alone. Pray for me, Pastor. Can you pray for me? If that's you, can I see your hand so I can pray for you? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Those hands. I see those hands all over the room. Those of you who said, Pastor, pray for me. Can you stand so I can, I can pray for you? Please stand right where you're at. Just stand right where you're at. I got more appointments than I ever know what to do with. I, I talk on the people on the phone with more people every day than, than people should be allowed to. I'm constantly texting and messaging and doing things, but I'm still alone. My mind is just chaotic and I got all kind of wild things in my mind. And if I don't control this, I, I, I don't know what might happen if I don't get this under control. Lord, I thank you for those who are in the room who raised their hand, those who who are standing even now, even as I send my prayers to you, I just join my faith with them and those in the room who are praying for them. That just like I needed someone to come and to help me and to rescue me, I pray you would do the same for them. Give them the courage to know that they don't have to just let their mind do whatever it is that they want, it wants to do, but they have the, the scriptures. that They can take thoughts captive. They can declare your word that they can stand in agreement with you. They don't have to be intimidated by the fact that if there is a physiological issue, if there is something that they need medication for, that they can take that and still be true to their faith. They can still be true to their idea that community is still needed. That it's okay for me to share my ideas and my thoughts and it's okay for someone to correct me to help give me wisdom in an area, to grow me and to mature me. I not only pray for them, but I pray for those that will be benefited by the fact that they are willing to stand and say, I still got some areas in my life that are immature. We all could be standing. We all could be standing in this, this room. We could all be being confronted with the idea that I need you. Don't let the shame of wrong thinking of wrong patterns in their mind prevent them from trusting you and moving forward with confidence. You remove shame. You convict, but you don't condemn. Thank you for exposing truth when we were operating on a lie. Thank you for giving strength when we were at our place of vulnerability and weakness. Thank you for giving them the courage to not only win, but then to share their defeats with others so that we all might win through the sharing of a testimony. May we as a community of faith be the better because we tell the truth in love. May we be the better as a community of Wichitans and, and Kansas. May we be the better because we choose to tell the truth in love. God, teach us how to speak to the lies of this world. Teach us how to say what needs to be said to redirect those who are believing the lies that they might grow and mature and develop. I'm praying for those who lost their life at the FedEx building. I'm praying for those who lose their lives daily that we might not know about because of immaturity in people. People who die because of domestic violence disputes. People who die because of drinking and driving. People who die because of someone's operating machinery while they're high. People who die who are just immature in some place. I'm praying for those who are maybe hurting right now because of something someone's done in their immaturity. 
I pray that we wouldn't allow another day, another moment, another conversation, another experience to go without us at least saying something. That we would find our families, our homes, our communities to be more healthy because we speak the truth in love. I pray for mental illness and those who have mental illness listening to me online or in the room. Those who've been trying to ignore it and say, I don't need the doctor, I just need some prayer. I pray that you would have the courage to do both, go seek out help, and at the same time get prayer. For those of you who have been unwilling to acknowledge it, you can't do this by yourself. One of the reasons you're having a hard time is because you still are unwilling to show that there's vulnerability and issues with you. You need the group. You need the group. I know COVID has created some patterns of behavior, but you need the group. You need face-to-face. -face. You need to be interacted with. You need someone to talk to you. You need to talk to somebody. You need to listen, be listened to. All of this needs to happen. God, give us courage. Give us courage to break the bad cycles, the bad patterns that have, have risen up in our community over a generation, the course of years, decades of isolationist behavior. We speak against it. It's better for us to be in community. It's better for us to hear from each other and to be heard. It's better for us to challenge, to love. I speak your blessing upon us and, our, and this community in Jesus' name. Those of you who are standing, I want you to look at me really quick. Here's what I want you to do. As you're thinking this week and you're going through, I want you to think rod and rebuke. Two words I want you to take. If you don't remember anything else, rod and rebuke. God, how is it? Because the scripture says with every temptation, he makes a way of what? Escape. Escapes looks like rods and rebukes, right? So when you have an unction, whether the inside the Holy Spirit or someone may outside may give you some type of clarity, it's the rod and the rebuke. Be thinking about that and don't refuse it because you just might be chronologically old enough to walk away from it. Think about what that means for you spiritually in some areas that might be immature.